Section 9 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, Numbers 128 and 130. Goodbye, Van Hao Letters 140, 141, and 142. Recording by Victor Guerrero. Letters 145, 148, 149, 150, and 186, read by Scott Farquhar. Letter number 128. To hear J. Kalka, doctor of laws in Prague, in the kingdom of Bohemia, the summer of 1814. A thousand thanks, my esteemed Kalka. At last I meet with a legal representative and a man who can both write and think without using and meaning formulas. You can scarcely imagine how I long for the end of this affair, as it not only interferes with my domestic expenditure, but is injurious to me in various ways. You know yourself that the sensitive spirit are not to be fettered by miserable anxieties, the much that I render my life happy is thus abstracted from it. Even my inclination and the duty assigned myself to serve suffering humanity by means of my art. I have been obliged to leave it, and must continue to do so. Footnote 1 you Write nothing about our monarchs and monarchies, for the newspapers give you every information on these subjects. Footnote 2 The intellectual realm is the most precious in my eyes, and far above all temporal and spiritual monarchies. Write to me, however, what you wish for yourself from my poor musical capabilities that I may, in so far as it lies in my power, supply something for your own musical sense and feeling. Do you now require all the papers connected with the Kinski case? If so, I will send them to you, as they contain most important testimony, which indeed I believe you read when with me. Think of me and do not forget that you represent a disinterested artist in your position to a niggly family, how gladly do men withhold from the poor artist in one respect what they pay him another, and there is no longer a those with whom an artist can invite himself to feast on ambrosia. Strive, my dear friend, to serve the tardy steps of justice, whenever I feel myself elevated high, and in happy moments revel in my artistic sphere, circumstance struck me down again, not more than these two lawsuits. You too have your disagreeable moments. Though with the views and the capabilities I know you to possess, especially in your profession, I could scarcely have believed this. Still, I must recall your attention to myself. I have drunk to the dregs a cup of bitter sorrow, and already earned Marty Dominard through my beloved artistic disciples and colleagues. I beg you will think of me every day, and imagine it to be an entire world, for it is really asking rather too much of you to think of so humble an individual as myself. I am, with the highest esteem and friendship, your obedient, Ludwig van Beethoven. Footnote 1. He supported the consumptive brother and his wife and child. Footnote 2. At the Vienna Congress, Beethoven was received with much distinction by the potentates present. End of letter number 128. Letter number 130. To Dr. Kalka. Vienna, August 22, 1814. You have shown a feeling for harmony, and you can resolve a great disorder in my life, which causes me much discomfort in a more pleasing melody, if you will. I shall expect to hear something of what you understand is likely to happen, as I eagerly anticipate the result of this most unjust affair with the Kinskis. When the princess was here, she seemed to be well disposed towards me, Still, I do not know how it will end. In the meantime, I must restrict myself in everything and wait with the entire confidence what is rightfully my own and legally devolves on me. And though unforeseen occurrences cause the change in this matter, still two witnesses recently bore testimony to the wish of the deceased prince that my appointed salary in Bacazetto should be paid in low sunshine, making up the original sum and the prince himself gave me sixty gold decas on account of my claim. Should the affair turn out badly for me by the conduct of the Kinski family, 
I will publish it in every newspaper to their disgrace. If there had been an heir, and the facts had been told to him in all their truth, just as I narrated them, I am convinced that he would at once have dubbed the word and deeds of his predecessor, as Doctor Wolf, the previous advocate, showing in the papers. Or shall I make you acquainted with them? As I am by no means sure that this letter will reach you safely, I defer sending you the pianoforte arrangement of my opera Fidelio, which is ready to be dispatched. I hope, in accordance with your usual friendliness, soon to hear from you. I am also writing to Doctor Wolf, who certainly does not treat anyone wolfishly, in order now to arouse his passion, so that he may have compassion on me. And neither take my purse nor my life. I am, with esteem, your true friend, Ludwig van Beethoven. End of letter number one hundred and thirty. Letter number one hundred and forty. To Herr Kauke, Vienna, January eleventh, eighteen fifteen. My good, worthy K. I received Baron Pasqualati's letter today, by which I perceive that you wish me to defer any fresh measures. In the meantime, all the necessary papers are lodged with Pasqualati, so be so good as to inform him that he must delay taking any further steps. Tomorrow, a council is to be held here, and you and P shall learn the result, probably tomorrow evening. Meanwhile. I wish you to look through the paper I sent to the court through Pasqualati, and read the appendix carefully. You will then see that Wolf and others have not given you correct information. One thing is certain: that there are sufficient proofs for any one who wishes to be convinced. How could it ever occur to me to think of written legal testimony with such a man as Kinsky, whose integrity and generosity were everywhere acknowledged? I remain. With the warmest affection and esteem, in haste, your friend, B. End of letter number one hundred and forty. Letter number one hundred and forty-one. To Herr Kauke. Eighteen fifteen. My dear and esteemed K, what can I think, or say, or feel? As for W, it seems to me that he not only showed his weak points. But gave himself no trouble to conceal them. It is impossible that he can have drawn up his statement in accordance with all the actual evidence he had. The order on the treasury about the rate of exchange was given by Kinsky previous to his consent to pay me my salary in Einlösungsschein, as the documents prove. Indeed, it is only necessary to examine the date to show this, so the first instruction is of importance. The specious facti prove that I was more than six months absent from Vienna. As I was not anxious to get the money, I allowed the affair to stand over, so the prince thus forgot to recall his former order to the treasury. But that he neither forgot his promise to me nor to Varnhagen, in my behalf, is evident by the testimony of Herr von Oliva, to whom shortly before his departure from hence, and indeed into another world, he repeated his promise. Making an appointment to see him when he should return to Vienna, in order to arrange the matter with the treasury, which, of course, was prevented by his untimely death. The testimony of the officer Varnhagen is accompanied by a document, he being at present with the Russian army, in which he states that he is prepared to take his oath on the affair. The evidence of Herr Oliver is also to the effect that he is willing to confirm his evidence by oath before the court. As I have sent away the testimony of Colonel Count Bentheim, I am not sure of its tenor. But I believe the count also says that he is prepared at any time to make an affidavit on the matter in court, and I am myself ready to swear before the court that Prince Kinsky said to me in Prague, he thought it only fair to me that my salary should be paid in Einlösungsschein. These were his own words. He gave me himself sixty gold ducats in Prague, on account. Good for about six hundred florins, as owing to my state of health, I could remain no longer and set off for Toplitz. The prince's word was sacred in my eyes, never having heard anything of him to induce me either to bring two witnesses with me or to ask him for any written pledge. 
I see from all this that Dr. Wolf has miserably mismanaged the business and has not made you sufficiently acquainted with the papers. Now as to the step I have just taken, the Archduke Rudolf asked me some time since whether the Kinski affair was yet terminated, having probably heard something of it. I told him that it looked very bad, as I knew nothing, absolutely nothing of the matter. He offered to write himself, but desired me to add a memorandum, and also to make him acquainted with all the papers connected with the Kinski case. After having informed himself on the affair, he wrote to the Oberstburggraf and enclosed my letter to him. The Oberstburggraf answered both the Duke and myself immediately. In the letter to me he said that I was to present a petition to the Provincial Court of Justice in Prague, along with all the proofs, whence it would be forwarded to him, and that he would do his utmost to further my cause. He also wrote in the most polite terms to the Archduke. Indeed, he expressly said that he was truly cognizant of the late Prince Kinski's intentions with regard to me and this affair, and that I might present a petition. The Archduke instantly sent for me, and desired me to prepare the document and to show it to him. He also thought that I ought to solicit payment in nine Losungschein, as there was ample proof, if not in strictly legal form, of the intentions of the prince, and no one could doubt that if he had survived, he would have adhered to his promise. If he were this day the heir, he would demand no other proofs than those already furnished. I sent this paper to Baron Pasqualati, who is kindly to present it himself to the court. Not till after the affair had gone so far did Dr. Adlersberg receive a letter from Dr. Wolf in which he mentioned that he had made a claim for 1,500 florins. As we have come so far as 1,500 florins with the Oberstburggraf, we may possibly get on to 1,800 florins. I do not esteem this any favor, for the late prince was one of those who urged me most to refuse a salary of 600 gold ducats per annum offered to me from Westphalia and he said at the time that he was resolved I should have no chance of eating hams in Westphalia. Another summons to Naples, somewhat later I equally declined, and I am entitled to demand a fair compensation for the loss I incurred. If the salary were to be paid in banknotes, what should I get? Not for a hundred florins in Convention's Guild, in lieu of such a salary as six hundred ducats. There are ample proofs for those who wish to act justly, and what does the Einlösungsschein now amount to? It is even at this moment no equivalent for what I refused. This affair was pompously announced in all the newspapers while I was nearly reduced to beggary. The intentions of the prince are evident, and in my opinion the family are bound to act in accordance with them unless they wish to be disgraced. Besides, the revenues have rather increased than diminished by the death of the prince, so there is no sufficient ground for curtailing my salary. I received your friendly letter yesterday, but I am too weary at this moment to write all that I feel towards you. I can only commend my case to your sagacity. It appears that the Oberstburggraf is the chief person, so what you wrote to the Archduke must be kept a profound secret, for it might not be advisable that anyone should know of it but you and Pasqualati. You have sufficient cause on looking through the papers to show how improperly Dr. Wolf has conducted the affair and that another course of action is necessary, I rely on your friendship to act as you think best for my interests. Rest assured of my warmest thanks, and pray excuse my writing more today, for a thing of this kind is very fatiguing, more so than the greatest musical undertaking. My heart has found something for you to which yours will respond, and this you shall soon receive. Do not forget me, poor tormented creature that I am, and act for me, and effect for me all that is possible. With high esteem, your true friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 141. Letter number 142. To Air Kauke, Vienna, January 14, 1815. My good and worthy K. The long letter I enclose was written when we were disposed to claim the 1800 florins. Baron Pasqualati's last letter, however, again made me waver, and Dr. Adelsberg advised me to adhere to the steps already taken. But as Dr. Wolf writes that he has offered in your name to accept 1,500 florins a year, I beg you will at least make every effort to get that sum. For this purpose, I send you the long letter written before we received Baron P's dissuasive one, as you may discover in it 
many reasons for demanding at least the 1500 florins. The Archduke too has written a second time to the Oberstburggraf, and we may conclude from this previous reply that he will certainly exert himself, and that we shall at all events succeed in getting the 1500 florins. Farewell. I cannot write another syllable. Such things exhaust me. May your friendship accelerate this affair. If it ends badly, then I must leave Vienna, because I could not possibly live on my income. For here things have come to such a pass that everything has risen to the highest price, and that price must be paid. The last two concerts I gave cost me 1,508 florins, and had it not been for the Empress's munificent present, I should scarcely have derived any profit whatever. Your faithful friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 142. Letter number 145. To Herr Kalka. Vienna, February 24th, 1815. My much esteemed K. I have repeatedly thanked you through Baron Pasqualati for your friendly exertions on my behalf, and I now beg to express one thousand thanks myself. The intervention of the Archduke could not be very palatable to you, and perhaps has prejudiced you against me. You have already done all that was possible when the Archduke interfered. If this had been the case sooner, and we had not employed that one-sided or many-sided or weak-sided Dr. Wolf, then, according to the assurances of the Oberstbuchraff himself, the affair might have had a still more favorable result. I shall therefore ever and always be grateful to you for your services. The court now deduct the sixty ducats I mentioned of my own accord, and to which the late prince never alluded either to his treasurer or any one else. Where truth could injure me it has been accepted, and so why reject it when it could have benefited me? How unfair! Baron Pasqualati requires information from you on various points. I am again very tired today, having been obliged to discuss many things with poor P. Such matters exhaust me more than the greatest efforts in composition. It is a new field, the soil of which I ought not to be required to till. This painful business has cost me many tears and much sorrow. The time draws near when Princess Kinsky must be written to. Now I must conclude. How rejoiced shall I be when I can write you the pure effusions of my heart once more, and this I mean to do as soon as I am extricated from all these troubles. Pray accept again my heartfelt thanks for all that you have done for me, and continue your regard for your attached friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 145. Letter number 148. To Herr Kalka, Vienna, April 8th. 1815. It seems scarcely admissible to be on the friendly terms on which I consider myself with you, and yet to be on such unfriendly ones that we should live close to each other and never meet. Footnote 1. You write tout à vous. Oh, you humbug, said I. No, no, it is really too bad. I should like to thank you nine thousand times for all your efforts on my behalf, and to reproach you twenty thousand that you came and went as you did. So all is a delusion. Friendship, kingdom, empire. All is only a vapor which every breeze wafts into a different form. Perhaps I may go to Toplitz, but it is not certain. I might take advantage of that opportunity to let the people of Prague hear something. What think you? If, indeed, you still think of me at all... As the affair with Lobkowitz is now almost come to a close, we may write Finney, though it far from fine is for me. Baron Pasqualati will no doubt soon call on you again. He also has taken much trouble on my account. Yes, indeed. It is easy to talk of justice, but to obtain it from others is no easy matter. In what way can I be of service to you in my own art? Say whether you prefer my celebrating the monologue of a fugitive king, or the perjury of a usurper, or the true friends who, though near neighbors, 
never saw each other? In the hope of soon hearing from you, for being now so far asunder it is easier to hold intercourse than when nearer, I remain with highest esteem your ever-devoted friend, Ludwig van Beethoven. Footnote 1. Kalka evidently had been recently in Vienna without visiting Beethoven. End of letter number 148. Letter number 149. To Herr Kalka. 1815. My dear and worthy K., I have just received from the syndic buyer in R the good news that you told him yourself about Prince F. K. As for the rest, you shall be perfectly satisfied. I take the liberty to ask you again to look after my interests with the Kinsky family, and I sojourn the necessary receipt for this purpose. See number 144. Perhaps some other way may be found, though it does not as yet occur to me, by means of which I need not importune you in future. On the 15th of October, 1815, I was attacked by an inflammatory cold, from the consequences of which I still suffer, and my art likewise. But it is to be hoped that I shall now gradually recover, and at all events be able once more to display the riches of my little realm of sweet sounds. Yet I am very poor in all else, owing to the times, to poverty of spirit, or what? Farewell. Everything around disposes us to profound silence, but this shall not be the case as to the bond of friendship and soul that unites us. I loudly proclaim myself, now as ever, your loving friend and admirer, Beethoven. End of letter number 149. Letter number 150. To Herr Kalka. 1815. My most worthy friend, my second letter follows that of yesterday, May 2nd. Pasqualati tells me today, after the lapse of a month and six days, that the house of Balabane is too high and mighty to assist me in this matter. I must therefore appeal to your insignificance, as I myself do not hesitate to be so mean as to serve other people. My house rent amounts to 550 florins, and must be paid out of the sum in question. As soon as the newly engraved pianoforte pieces appear, you shall receive copies, and also of the battle. Forgive me, forgive me, my generous friend. Some other means must be found to forward this affair with due promptitude. In haste, your friend and admirer, Beethoven. End of letter number 150. Letter number 186. To Herr Kalka. Baden, September 16th, 1816. My worthy K., I send you herewith the receipt according to your request, and beg that you will kindly arrange that I should have the money by the 1st of October, and without any deduction, which has hitherto been the case. I also particularly beg you will not assign the money to Baron P. I will tell you why when we meet. For the present, let this remain between ourselves. Send it either direct to myself, or, if it must come through another person, do not let it be Baron P. It would be best for the future, as the house rent is paid here for the great house belonging to Kinski, that my money should be paid at the same time. This is only my own idea. The terze you heard of will soon be engraved, which is infinitely preferable to all written music, you shall therefore receive an engraved copy, and likewise some more of my unruly offspring. In the meantime, I beg that you will see only what is truly good in them, and look with an indulgent eye on the human frailties of these poor innocents. Besides, I am full of cares, being in reality father to my late brother's child. Indeed, I might have ushered into the world a second part of the Flauto Magico, having also been brought into contact with a queen of the night. I embrace you from my heart, and hope soon in so far to succeed that you may owe some thanks to my muse. My dear, worthy Kalka, I ever am your truly attached friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 186. End of section 9 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace.
Section 10 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. Selected Letters, number 151, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 151. To Mr. Solomon, London. Footnote 1. Vienna, June 1, 1815. My good fellow, countryman, I always hope to meet you one day in London, but many obstacles have intervened to prevent the fulfillment of this wish, and as there seems now no chance of such a thing, I hope you will not refuse a request of mine, which is that you will be so obliging as to apply to some London publisher and offer him the following works of mine. Grand Trio for Piano, Violin, and Violoncello, Opus 97, 80 Ducats. Piano Fort Sonata with Violin Accompaniment, Opus 96, 60 Ducats. Grand Symphony in A, one of my very best, a short symphony in F, the eighth, quartet for two violins, viola, and violoncello, in F minor, opus 95, grand opera in score, thirty ducats. Cantata with choruses and solos, the glorious moment, thirty ducats. Scoring of the Battle of Vittoria and Wellington's Victory, 80 ducats. Also, the pianoforte arrangement of the same, if not already published, which, I am told here, is the case. I have named the prices of some of these works on a scale which I hold to be suitable for England, but I leave it to you to say what sum should be asked, both for these and the others. I hear, indeed, that Kramer is also a publisher. Note, this is John Kramer, whose piano fort playing was highly estimated by Beethoven. But my scholar, Rise, lately wrote to me that Kramer had not long since publicly expressed his disapproval of my works. I trust from no motive but that of being of service to art, and if so, I have no right to object to his doing this. If, however, Kramer should wish to possess any of my pernicious works, I shall be as well satisfied with him as with any other publisher. But I reserve the right to give these works to be published here, so that they may appear at the same moment in London and Vienna. Perhaps you may also be able to point out to me in what way I can recover from the Prince Regent, note, afterwards, George the Fourth. The expenses of transcribing the Battle Symphony on Wellington's victory at Vittoria to be dedicated to him, for I have long ago given up all hope of receiving anything from that quarter. I have not even been deemed worthy of an answer whether I am to be authorized to dedicate the work to the Prince Regent. And, when at last I propose to publish it here, I am informed that it has already appeared in London. What a fatality for an author! While the English and German papers are filled with accounts of the success of the work as performed at Drury Lane, and that theatre drawing great receipts from it. The author has not one friendly line to show, not even payment for the cost of copying the work, and is thus deprived of all profit. Footnote 2. For if it be true that the pianoforte arrangement is soon to be published by a German publisher, copied from the London one, then I lose both my fame and my honorarium. The well-known generosity of your character 
leads me to hope that you will take some interest in the matter, and actively exert yourself on my behalf. The inferior paper money of this country is now reduced to one-fifth of its value, and I am paid according to this scale. After many struggles and considerable loss, I at length succeeded in obtaining the full value. But at this moment the old paper money has again risen far beyond the fifth part, so that it is evident my salary becomes, for the second time, almost nil, and there is no hope of any compensation. My whole income is derived from my works. If I could rely on a good sale in England, it would doubtless be very beneficial to me. Pray, be assured of my boundless gratitude. I hope soon, very soon, to hear from you. I am, with esteem, your sincere friend, Ludwig von Beethoven. Footnote 1. J. P. Solomon was likewise a native of Bonn, and one of the most distinguished violin players of his time. He had been Kappelmeister to Prince Heinrich of Prussia, and then went to London, where he was very active in the introduction of German music. It was through his agency that Beethoven's connection with Birchall, the music publisher, first commenced, to whom a number of his letters are addressed. Footnote 2. Undoubtedly the true reading of these words, which in the copy before me are marked as difficult to decipher. End of letter number 151. End of section 10 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Robert Scott, June the 18th, 2007. Of Selected Letters of Beethoven, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Robert Scott. Selected Letters, number 162, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 162. To rise. Vienna, Wednesday, November the 22nd, 1815. I hasten to apprise you that I have today forwarded by post the pianoforte arrangement of the symphony in A to the care of Messrs. Coots. As the court is absent, few indeed, almost no carriers, go from here. Moreover, the post is the safest way. The symphony ought to be brought out about March. The precise day I will fix myself. So much time has already been lost on this occasion that I could not give an earlier notice of the period of publication. The trio and the violin sonata may be allowed more time, and both will be in London a few weeks hence. I earnestly entreat you dear Rise, to take charge of these matters, and also to see that I get the money. I require it, and it costs me a good deal before all is sent off. I have lost six hundred florins of my yearly salary. At the time of the banknotes there was no loss, but then came the Ein Losungsschein, note, reduced paper money, which deprives me of these six hundred florins. After entailing on me several years of annoyance, and now the total loss of my salary. We are at present arrived at a point when the Einlosenschung are even lower than the banknotes ever were. I pay one thousand florins for house rent. You may thus conceive all the misery caused by paper money. My poor unhappy brother, note, 
Karl von Beethoven, a cashier in Vienna, is just dead. Note, November 15th, 1815. He had a bad wife. For some years past, he has been suffering from consumption, and from my wish to make his life less irksome, I may compute what I gave him at ten thousand florins. Note, Viner Varung. This indeed does not seem much to an Englishman, but it is a great deal for a poor German, or rather, Austrian. The unhappy man was latterly much changed, and I must say, I lament him from my heart, though I rejoice to think I left nothing undone that could contribute to his comfort. Tell Mr. Birchall that he is to repay the postage of my letters to you and Mr. Solomon, and also yours to me. He may deduct this from the sum he owes me. I am anxious that those who work for me shall lose as little as possible by it. Quote, Wellington's victory at Vittoria, end quote, footnote one to follow, must have arrived long ago, through the Messrs. Coots. Mr. Burkall need not send payment till he is in possession of all the works. Only do not delay letting me know when the day is fixed for publication of the pianoforte arrangement. For today... I only further earnestly recommend my affairs to your care. I shall be equally at your service at any time. Farewell, dear Rise. Your friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Quote, this is also to be the title of the piano fort arrangement. Note by Beethoven. End of letter 162. End of section 11 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Robert Scott, June the 29th, 2007. Of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. Selected Letters, Numbers 212, 213 and 214 by Ludwig van Beethoven As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Null and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 212 To S. R. Steiner, Music Publisher, Vienna Highest born, most admirable, and marvellous Lieutenant General Footnote Beethoven styled himself Generalissimus, Herr R. Steiner, Lieutenant General, and his partner, Tobias Haslinger, Adjutant and Adjutant General. End of footnote. We beg you to give us banknotes for twenty-four gold ducats at yesterday's rate of exchange, and to send them to us this evening or to-morrow, in order that we may forthwith remit and transmit them. I should be glad and happy if your trustworthy adjutant were to bring me these, as I have something particular to say to him. He must forget all his resentment like a good Christian. We acknowledge his merits and do not contest his demerits. In short, and once for all, we wish to see him. This evening would suit us best. We have the honour to remain, most astounding Lieutenant-General, your devoted Generalissimus. End of letter number 212 Letter number 213 To Lieutenant-General von Steiner Private Publicandum After due consideration and by the advice of our council, we have determined and decreed that henceforth, on all our works published with German titles, the word Pianoforte is to be replaced by that of Hammerklavier, and our worthy lieutenant-general, his adjutant, and all whom it may concern, are charged with the execution of this order. 
instead of pianoforte, hammerklavier. Such is our will and pleasure. Given on the 23rd of January, 1817, by the Generalissimus. Manu propria. End of letter number 213. Letter number 214. To Steiner. The following dedication occurred to me of my new sonata. Sonata for the pianoforte, or Hammerklavier. Composed and dedicated to Frau Baronin Dorothea Erdmann, née Graumann, by Ludwig van Beethoven. If the title is already engraved, I have the following proposals to make, viz. that I pay for one title, I mean that it should be at my expense, or reserved for another new sonata of mine, for which purpose the minds of the Lieutenant-General, or Pleno Titulo, Lieutenant-General and First Councillor of State, must be opened to usher it into the light of day. The title is to be previously shown to a good linguist. Hammerklavier is certainly German, and so is the device. Honour to whom honour is due. How is it, then, that I have as yet received no reports of the carrying out of my orders, which, however, have no doubt been attended to? Ever and always you're attached, amicus at amicum de amico. N.B. I beg you will observe the most profound silence about the dedication, as I wish it to be a surprise. End of letter number 214 End of section 12 of Selected Letters of Beethoven As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Nohl and translated by Lady Grace Wallace Recording by Gesine in October 2007Thirteen of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen H. Wilson. Selected Letters, number 281, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 281. Petition to the Magistracy. Footnote 1. October 30th, 1819. Gentlemen, my brother, Karl van Beethoven, died on November 5th, 1815, leaving a boy twelve years old, his son Karl. In his will, by Clause 5, he bequeathed to me the guardianship of the boy, and in the codicil B, he expressed a wish that his widow, Johanna, should have a share in this duty, adding that, for the sake of his child, he recommended her to submit to my guidance. This explicit declaration of the father, added to my legal claim, I being the nearest relative, clause 198, entitles me clearly to the guardianship of my nephew, Karl van Beethoven, and the Court of Justice, by their decree E, committed to me under existing circumstances the guardianship to the exclusion, moreover, of Beethoven's widow. A journey on business having compelled me to be for some time absent, I did not object to an official guardian supplying my place for the time, which was effected by the nomination of the town sequestrator, Herr Nussbach. Being now, however, finally settled here, and the welfare of the boy very precious to me, both love and duty demand that I should resume my rights, especially as this talented lad is coming to an age when greater care and expense must be bestowed on his education, on which his whole future prospects depend. This duty ought not to be confided to any woman, far less to his mother, who possesses neither the will nor the power to adopt those measures indispensable to a manly and suitable education. I am the more anxious to reclaim my guardianship of Carl, as I understand that, in consequence of want of means to defray the expenses of the school where I placed him, he is to be removed, and his mother wishes him to live with her, in order herself to spend his trifling provision and thus save the one half of her pension which, according to the decree, she is bound to apply to his use. I have hitherto taken a paternal charge of my nephew, and I intend to do the same in future at my own expense, being resolved that the hopes of his deceased father and the expectations I have formed for this clever boy shall be fulfilled by his becoming an able man and a good citizen. With this view, I accordingly request that the highly respected magistrates whom I now address will be pleased to annul the town sequestrator Nussbach's interim office and forthwith transfer to me the sole guardianship of my nephew, Karl von Beethoven. Footnote 2. Ludwig von Beethoven. 
Footnote 1. Evidently drawn up by his advocate, Dr. Bach, from Beethoven's Notes. Footnote 2. The magisterial degree of November 4th, 1819, was adverse to Beethoven. End letter number 281. End of section 13 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Stephen H. Wilson, Elkridge, Maryland. Prometheus.libsyn.com Prometheus Radio Theater www.prometheusradiotheater.com dot com fourteen of selected letters of beethoven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen h wilson selected letters number two eighty seven by ludwig von beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 287 To the Royal and Imperial High Court of Appeal January 7, 1820 Gentlemen, on the plea of the Decree A, I sought to have transferred to myself the guardianship of my nephew, Carl V. Beethoven, but was referred by the magistracy to the previous decision. On my consequent remonstrance, the same result ensued. I find myself the more aggrieved by this, inasmuch as not only are my own rights set at naught, but even the welfare of my nephew is thus utterly disregarded. I am therefore compelled to have recourse to the highest court of appeal to lay before them my well-founded claim, and rightfully to demand that the guardianship of my nephew should be restored to me. My reasons are the following. First, I am entitled to the guardianship of my nephew, not only by his father's will, but by the law, and this the court of justice confirmed to the exclusion of the mother. When business called me away from Vienna, I conceded that Herr Nussbach should act for me ad interim. Having now, however, taken up my residence here, the welfare of my nephew demands that I should again undertake the office of his guardian. Second, my nephew has arrived at an age when he requires to be trained to a higher degree of cultivation. Neither his mother nor his present guardian are calculated to guide the boy in the pursuit of his studies. The former, in the first place, because she is a woman, and as to her conduct, it has been legally proved that, to say the least of it, she has no creditable testimonials to bring forward. Footnote 1. On which account she was expressly prohibited from acting by the Court of Justice. How the Honorable Magistracy could nevertheless appoint her is quite incomprehensible. The latter is unfit because on the one hand his office as sequestrator and administrator of houses and lands occupies his time too much to enable him properly to undertake the duties of guardian to the boy, and on the other, because his previous occupation as a paper manufacturer does not inspire me with any confidence that he possesses the intelligence or judgment indispensable to conduct a scientific education. Third, the welfare of my nephew is dearer to my heart than it can be to anyone else. I am myself childless, and have no relations except this boy, who is full of talent, and I have good grounds to hope the best for him if properly trained. Now I am compelled to hear that he has been delayed a whole year by remaining in his previous class from want of means to defray the expense, and that his mother intends to remove him from his present school and wishes him to live with her. What a misfortune to the boy were he to become a victim to the mismanagement of his mother! who would fain squander on herself that portion of her pension which she is obliged to devote to the education of her son. I have therefore declared in due form to the Honorable Magistracy that I am myself willing to undertake the expenses of his present school and also to provide the various masters required. Being rather deaf, which is an impediment to conversation, I have requested the aid of a colleague and suggested for this purpose Herr Peters, Councillor of Prince Lobkowitz, in order that a person may forthwith be appointed to superintend the education and progress of my nephew, that his moral character may one day command esteem, and whose acquirements may be a sure guarantee to all those who feel an interest in the youth's welfare, that he will undoubtedly receive the education and culture necessary to develop his abilities. My efforts and wishes have no other aim than to give the boy the best possible education, his abilities justifying the brightest hopes, and to fulfill the trust placed in my brotherly love by his father. The shoot is still flexible, 
but if longer neglected it will become crooked and outgrow the gardener's training hand and upright bearing, intellect and character be destroyed forever. I know no duty more sacred than the education and training of a child. The chief duties of a guardian consist in knowing how to appreciate what is good and in adopting a right course. Then alone has proper attention been devoted to the welfare of his ward, whereas in opposing what is good he neglects his duty. Indeed, keeping in view what is most for the benefit of the boy, I do not object to the mother in so far sharing in the duties of a guardian that she may visit her son and see him and be apprised of all the measures adopted for his education, but to entrust her with the sole guardianship of the boy without a strict guardian by her side would cause the irrevocable ruin of her son. On these cogent grounds I reiterate my well-founded solicitation and feel the more confident of a favorable answer, as the welfare of my nephew alone guides my steps in this affair. Footnote 2 Ludwig von Beethoven Footnote 1 Schindler states that during these law proceedings the widow of Beethoven's brother had another child. Footnote 2 The court excluded Karl's mother from all share in his education and from all direct influence over her son and again restored to Beethoven the full authority of a guardian. End Letter number 287 End of section 14 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Stephen H. Wilson, Elkridge, Maryland. Prometheus.libsyn.com Prometheus Radio Theater www.prometheusradiotheater.com